Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to this um, second in our uh, series, actually, of pieces, events around the uh, deriving from the big commission on uh, economic future that was run for President Macron uh, in France over the last uh, year or so. Uh, we had an overview um, of that commission before the summer. Now today and through the, this week, we're going to have uh, individual events today on inequality um, and over the next week on demographics and on climate change. Um, today, we are incredibly fortunate to have with us uh, two of the leading thinkers uh, in the world uh, on issues of inequality uh, and um, the economic response to that. Uh, we're first, we're, we're having, we, we have Stephanie Stancheva, who is professor at the University of uh, Harvard University, uh, where she uh, focuses particularly on the attitudes of people towards uh, inequality and towards policies towards uh, inequality. We also have uh, Danny Roderick, one of the leading, um, uh, one of the leading uh, thinkers in uh, political uh, economy, also at Harvard University. He's currently president of the International Economic Association, and he looks at issues around globalization, growth development, and political economy, and has recently published the book Combating Inequality, Rethinking Government, Government's uh, Role. Um, they're going to speak for hopefully no more than half an hour or so between them. Uh, then Richard Blundell, Research Director at the IFS will respond and then there is plenty of time for questions and you should have access to the uh, Slido um, app to allow you to uh, uh, ask those questions and please do uh, that. So um, if I could hand over, I'm not sure who's going first, whether it's Danny or Stephanie, but if, uh, if whoever is going first could do so, that would be marvellous. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for That's the introduction. Um, thank you for asking us to present this, um, this, this work. Um, I will share some slides. So I hope everyone can see this. Um, so this is joint, uh, this is joint work, uh, obviously, with, with Danny, who's here and who will cover the second part. And it was um, based on a report created for President Macron with other great economists, some of which are here, like Richard. Um, so our topic was inequality and economic insecurity. And our goal was to provide um, a policy agenda for inclusion and inclusive growth, rather than very specific recommendations. Uh, our starting point is actually this policy matrix um, that has proved to be very useful, uh, which allows us to categorize policies depending on which groups they affect and at what stage of the economy they, they happen. Um, so if you look at the... Uh, sorry, the sorry, Stephanie, to introduce the uh, screen doesn't appear to be going properly. Oh, okay. So if you try um, that again. Let me try again. Uh, would you mind stop sharing your screen? Um, perhaps I, I see a... 
Okay, perfect. Does this work now? Can yes. You see okay, yes. great. So this is the matrix now after a bit of a, a bit of a wait. So if you focus on the rows of this matrix, you can see the income segment that the policy targets. So one can target bottom incomes or the middle class or rather top incomes. In the columns of this matrix, uh, we can see different stages. So typically we talk about sort of redistribution policies which happen after incomes are realized and then pre-distribution policies. But we actually find it useful to split it into three stages. So first we have the pre-production stage, which is what happens before people even enter the labor market. Um, this is about what sort of endowments people bring to the market. Um, things like education policy, training policy, and targeted at top incomes, things like inheritance and estate taxation, which affect the financial endowments people bring to the market. The production stage is very much the labor market, both for firms and for workers. Um, here, a range of policies, you know, from minimum wage or other regulations uh, to on-the-job training, uh, R&D tax credits and innovation fostering, all these policies that happen here. And then the post-production stage is once incomes have been realized, what to do to redistribute them to reduce inequality. So this is things like progressive taxation, social insurance, like unemployment insurance, um, and then you know anything related to top income or wealth taxes. And a traditional welfare state tends to actually center on the first pillar and the third pillar. Um, it tends to focus a lot on providing education, um, both for you know, young people and then perhaps further in life as well. And then on the, on the post-production side uh, with a social insurance and progressive tax system. And this makes a lot of sense um, in an economy in which once everyone has the proper skills and education, they can find a job. However, this has no longer been the case in, in, you know, in recent decades. Um, the progress of globalization and technological change has led to a hollowing out of, of the middle class and of opportunities for good jobs. So what we want to focus on as well is actually this middle column here, uh, which is the production stage, which in itself can perpetuate inequalities or you know, amplify inequalities. Um, and which makes a lot of sense to target as well, in addition to the other three pillars. So our starting point was actually to try and see what people think about these things at all. Um, we've, been, we've been doing these uh, large scale surveys for, for a while, which is a very useful tool to get into people's minds and see you know, what their perceptions are, what their attitudes are, what their views are. And so we started with a survey here, uh, actually two surveys, um, which were done on, on large representative French samples to actually see what people think about these various policies, how they perceive their own opportunities, their own insecurities, um, their ability to get a job, and then a range of government policies. So these two surveys here, which if you're more interested, you can find all the results of online. Um, to cover a few of those, let's focus on the jobs inequality and insecurity survey. In particular, what people think are good jobs and what they actually aim for and what they aspire to. And so when we ask people, what is a good job to you? Um, obviously the answers are in French and it's uh, to not mess up the word cloud. It's actually you know, difficult to translate this, but I will, I will summarize this. So people of course care about good pay like sufficient, you know, sufficient remuneration and salaries. That's, that comes out very, very strongly. However, soon after come some other considerations such as having a good work atmosphere, feeling good at work, um, being able to balance private life with work life, uh, having good working conditions, having an interesting job. So a lot of other things come up uh, in people's answers, which by the way are not, you know, guided or primed, people can freely write what they want. So of course pay matters, but things like good working conditions, good professional relations and good work environments, as well as you know, um, a nice and interesting work matter to people as well. And then if we ask what are the best aspects of your job, what do you actually value in your current job? 
Then things that come up a lot are flexibility. Uh, people like to have flexibility and autonomy to choose their work times, human contact, um, you know, again, good atmosphere, good relations with colleagues, uh, free time. Obviously, people value having a good work-life balance. Um, and then also security of employment, having a stable employment rather than having to switch constantly or worry. Some other things that uh, came out very starkly in people's responses are that people very much like being able to use their skills. Um, so they, you know, they don't, they don't love being in jobs that either require too much of them or actually, you know, that they're overqualified for. Um, unfortunately, people also tend to think that good jobs are not accessible to everyone, uh, which is, you know, one of the one of the diagnoses we had even, you know, even a priori starting this project. So first, people think that good jobs are obtained often through family networks and already having have access to specific degrees. Um, there's very large regional divergences in, in the ability to access good jobs. So between high and low density or, you know, rural urban areas broadly, very, very big discrepancies in people's perceptions, which are justified given the data. Um, and then, you know, people who are younger um, have started to really de decrease their criteria for what is a good job, in particular because they actually have very high unemployment rates, while people who are a bit older, um, who have lower unemployment rates, have much stricter criteria. And then if you ask people what, do you, what they think the causes for job losses um, in general are, many, many, 57% blame globalization and outsourcing, and 26% blame technological change. Um, another 14% actually blame you know, immigration. Um, but you know, as economists, it's interesting because um, these are not necessarily the rankings that, that we would give. But so it comes out very strongly that globalization, trade, outsourcing is a major culprit in people's minds. People definitely have trust in the fact that the government can do things. So people typically think the government has capacities and tools to stimulate good jobs. And when you face them with a trade off between creating more jobs versus quality jobs, they're happy to take some of that trade off. So to actually, you know, emphasize quality and good jobs rather than just creating any jobs for the sake of numbers. Um, they're very much in favor of work study programs, dual programs that help people get into the labor market and are very favorable to better job search assistance that involves local employers too. Um, and lots of people are actually very favorable to getting a bit more of a dialogue between you know, citizens and the government. For instance, through the use of permanent surveys and feedback channels, um, they want to feel that and very few feel that actually the views of people like them are even taken into account in the policy process. So a few of the, of the results of these surveys, but again, much more that uh, we're happy to talk about in the Q&A and that's all available online. So faced with this, um, we actually, uh, you know, we're even more convinced that we want to really think about this middle column of good jobs um, because in people's survey answers, as well as in the literature and economics, um, it's, it's quite clear that this traditional welfare state model that presumes, you know, everyone with additional, with adequate skills or education can find good middle class jobs, that model seems to no longer be the case. Um, there's a lot that is happening that is a structural problem, and this inadequacy of good middle class jobs is driven by secular trends which are not going anywhere that are going to that are going to continue and so there's this picture that emerges um, again in the survey as well of sort of permanently depressed regional labor markets with bad jobs uh, and then some you know islands of great jobs that are technologically advanced that typically tend to benefit very specific and smaller groups of people uh, that actually get all the gains from globalization and then many, many other people are left behind. And so the traditional welfare state policies are really inadequate to address um, these, you know, the roots of these problems. They can perhaps patch up the, the symptoms a little bit. And so in this, in this report, we very much keep focusing on the first and third pillars. Of course, we don't want to abandon them. They're very, very important. So the pre-production stage with inheritance taxation, education, and then the post-production stage with social transfers, unemployment insurance, um, progressive taxation. But then we very much also focus on the very middle center piece here, 
which is the production stage uh, and middle class, you know, households. So Danny will talk a lot about this middle pillar. On the first pillar, I just wanted to raise one of the policy proposals that we had because it is perhaps one of the more unusual ones between the first and third pillars. Um, and it is something that I think could be interesting for, you know, for several countries. And so that is on inheritance taxation. When we think of estate or inheritance taxation, that's one of the tools to reduce the persistence of wealth across generations. It's a way to break a mechanical link between you know, parents' wealth and children's wealth. And countries differ in terms of the systems that they have. In places like France, it is based on you know, the heir, so it's called an inheritance tax. In places like the US, it's based on the estate. Uh, so it's the person uh, that is giving the wealth away. Their whole estate is taxed. Regardless of how it actually works, uh, these are very unpopular taxes. Again, this is shown by some survey work. Um, they're part, that's partly due to misunderstanding of actually how they work and who bears them. For instance, in the US, uh, there's this very stark finding that people think that around a third of all estates will pay the estate tax when in fact it's less than one in thousand households. So very large um, you know, misunderstandings and misperceptions. Nevertheless, they're very unpopular too because of a very thorny ethical issue. So it depends very much whether people take the perspective of the parents or the children. Many people across you know, the political spectrum agree that it's unfair if children from different families start with very different opportunities or end up with very different wealth levels simply because of their parents' circumstances. That's a very you know, strong bipartisan agreement. At the same time, again, in a very bipartisan way, people tend to also agree that it's unfair to tax parents who have worked hard and saved hard for their children. But this is a fundamental dilemma because you can't really have it both ways. Um, and when you ask people to take that trade-off into account, views are very conflicted on whether you tend to, in the end, on balance, side with parents or rather with children. And so one of the possible solutions, there is no perfect solution, it is, it is a dilemma, is to move to a beneficiary-based system that is progressive in the cumulative amount received, regardless of when you get it and regardless of who you get it from. So each heir, each person will have this account essentially where everything is counted over time and they will end up paying a progressive tax in the total they receive over their life. This is actually Tony Atkinson's proposal originally and somewhat similar system exists currently in Ireland. That's the only close example to that. It's good because it actually would allow for true progressivity instead of you know, allowing exemptions transfer by transfer, which ends up benefiting people with high wealth that can target and time these transfers well, it would actually allow for true progressivity in a way that's less easy to escape uh, over one's lifetime. It's possible to largely exempt the middle class, which would address you know, citizens' concern that they don't really like taxing parents that work and save for their children. They would really rather tax wealthier households that already have a big chunk of wealth. Um, and so this is a way to actually improve progressivity and perhaps the perceived fairness of the system. So I will stop here and let um, Danny take over about this very important middle pillar um, and the good job strategy. Okay, I'm trying to start my video. Okay, it's working. Uh, let me also um, share my screen, uh, which is really continuing um, continuing um, Stephanie's presentation. I, I I take it you can see my screen. Somebody say yes. Yes. Okay. Great. <laughs> okay. Um, so as, as, as Stephanie said, um, we wanted to emphasize uh, both uh, improving uh, <clears throat> pre-production, post-production uh, columns um, of, of, the, of the system uh, through better education uh, on the one hand and improved taxation as in the inheritance taxation case that Stephanie talked about. But we also emphasize that um, 
that that we need to ensure that that that, that um, the productive structure also responds uh, to the uh, needs of the economy. That we can't simply do it uh, simply by um, investing um, in in endowments on the one hand and then redistributing um, on the other, that we need to um, create uh, also good jobs um, and address this issue of um, labor market uh, polarization and the disappearance of good jobs, particularly in, in parts of the country where um, that have been disadvantaged by uh, trade or by the industrialization, technological change and so forth. Um, and, and, and to create good jobs in particular, it's not simply enough to have um, you know, good uh, regulations, high minimum wages and, and good labor standards. Of course, on this dimension, um, France uh, stands out as a relatively uh, progressive country. In fact, um, income inequality has not perceptibly increased um, in, uh, in France uh, compared to, um, to many other advanced countries and the United States or the UK in particular. Uh, but um, I think um, sort of emphasizing high minimum wages and um, high transfers um, have come at the expense of possibly exacerbating the youth uh, employment um, a problem that uh, relatively less skilled younger workers are disadvantaged uh, going into the labor market and, and uh, youth and unemployment remains very, very high. So I think the, the, the starting point for a discussion on, on the jobs front, on, on shoring up the employment structure, particularly the good jobs, has to start uh, with an understanding that that we need greater access to good jobs that is only going to come with wider dissemination of more innovative and technologically more progressive firms. Uh, that is to say that uh, good jobs are going to require good firms that you have, if you want to have good jobs in the sense of not just higher wages, but also firms that offer um, satisfactory uh, job ladders, um, greater degree of autonomy at work and so forth. Those are likely to be good productive firms uh, and we cannot simply um, uh, legislate that through higher minimum wages or higher standards uh, that we need to ensure that we're also working on creating uh, good firms. Um, and, and here the basic uh, externality, if we wanna talk about in economic terms is that firms basically do not sufficiently internalize the social consequences of their employment decisions. Uh, on the one hand, there are uh, sort of larger social and political costs um, in particular regions when labor markets become depressed in terms of everything from um, you know, higher crime rates to break down in families to greater support for nativist far-right groups uh, to, um, on the other hand, um, sort of the adoption of technologies, which might be profitable for the entrepreneurs and the firms, but are not necessarily socially profitable. Um, Ajamal and Restrepo in their work talk about so-so technologies, uh, adoption of technologies that are particularly skill and capital in uh, intensive that replace labor where the overall productivity gains are relatively low, um, but uh, might be still profitable. And, and those have significant uh, adverse effects on, on employment prospects. So uh, ultimately thinking about it in, in this way uh, makes us think that sort of the, the broad framework in which we need to think about in this good jobs problem is as a kind of a quid pro quo uh, between state uh, and state agencies and firms uh, that on the one hand, uh, state agencies um, uh, see themselves as responsible uh, for providing a broad portfolio of public services that are productivity enhancing uh, for firms and, 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 uh, and workers, but in exchange for um, commitments, soft commitments uh, on the part of firms to, to expand good jobs to respond in the, in the needed, um, needed direction. Um, there are sort of four planks of this strategy that, that we discuss um, in the, um, uh, in the report, and I'm just going to be um, only scratching uh, the surface of this. Uh, but uh, those four planks are essentially one to, um, to enhance um, existing act active labor market policies to link them much better to employers than they exist currently. Secondly, uh, to enhance existing industrial or regional policies 
uh, that um, tend to target investment more than they target good jobs at, at, at the moment. So sort of redressing that balance. Third, um, you know, in a sense, the most difficult recommendation because there are so few precedents on which we can rely on is uh, thinking about innovation policies that are explicitly taking into account the endogeneity of the direction of technological change and, and in emphasizing investments in more labor-friendly technologies. And third, um, uh, um, essentially the international component of this is that if, you know, for, 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 you know, if the domestic strategy is correct, is, is appropriate, then I think it needs to be um, uh, uh, supported by a set of international policies that essentially protect the provision of good jobs at home. That is not trade protectionism, but it is um, uh, uh, policies on the both on the global taxation front and on the um, safeguards front in, in terms of trade policy uh, that that uh, that ensure that that the conduct of international uh, taxation and trade policies are consistent with these domestic uh, good job policies. I'll say a little bit more about each uh, in a second, uh, but I also emphasize that another dimension of our uh, recommendations is to, uh, to argue for a mode of government or regulation uh, that is uh, sort of rather different from the standard uh, ex ante um, arm's length model of regulation on the part of government or government agencies uh, with respect to whether it's training or, or industrial policies, uh, that, that we propose a, a kind of a much more collaborative, iterative, uh, sort of um, experimental set of arrangements between private and set state actors that, um, uh, that take into account the provisionality of many of the objectives and have the capacity to self-correct themselves over time uh, in, and, and build trust over time uh, among different parties as, as more information uh, is, 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 is uncovered. Um, so this is a general kind of a, a approach that underlies all of these different flanks. So let me just say a few more words about each one of these flanks and, and, then, and then I'll stop. On active labor market policies, I think we take our, 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 our cue or our, our uh, inspiration from um, uh, evidence uh, on a range of uh, so-called sectoral labor market, sectoral labor training programs in the United States that have been very successful uh, when uh, dealing with the sort of the very low end of the labor market uh, in terms of, and what stands out uh, with these um, successful programs uh, is that they tend to be uh, what's called a sort of a, a dual customer approach, which is that they focus both on the job seeker and on potential employers. So they emphasize as much, uh, you know, so preparing employers, so to speak, to hire workers as they do uh, preparing job seekers for employment. And I think that aspect of, of uh, this, this dual um, uh, customer approach um, is is uh, has has been shown to be much more effective um, at at, um, at 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 generating employment and higher and, and higher wage gains. Now, this is only proof of concept in some ways, and and the existing public employment services in Europe, to some extent, have been moving in this direction of greater employer uh, engagement. Uh, but I think there is there's more that can be done and there's certainly a lot more room for experimentation in this dimension. And, and we sort of, we wanna push existing public employment services in France or, or, or really everywhere uh, to have a much greater engagement with employers, both to get, better understand what their needs are, but also get employers to better understand uh, what the skills and capabilities of the local labor force uh, is. So that, that uh, once again, that, um, that quid pro quo nature of this relationship. On industrial and, and regional policies, um, we want to move away from the dominant approach to industrial policy, which is uh, which takes the form of essentially tax incentives or open-ended subsidies uh, and moving away instead to um, a, a form of um, uh, business support that is much more flexible, that is that you know, form where state agencies can offer a portfolio or a package of services uh, that might um, uh, you know, range from, uh, you know, changing local um, uh, zoning rules to providing very specific training to providing marketing or technology assistance 
uh, to uh, assistance with uh, greenfield development um, uh, that is really based on the needs of individual firms uh, rather than simply cash grants or, or, or tax incentives. And secondly, that, that these programs will be much more explicitly based on, uh, on, on the provision of um, good employment opportunities. So the employment conditionality would be much more explicit here. Um, and that's um, even though business incentives often are motivated by the desire to increase employment, it's relatively rare that there is explicit conditionality on, on employment and we want to um, enhance that component. Um, third, we want uh, innovation policies and innovation subsidies to be much more uh, conscious um, of the need to promote um, employer-friendly technologies. And we want to militate against the very prevalent notion that technological change is something that happens on its own and that there's really very little that one can do about that. And so if one looks at the discussion in policy circles about the need to train and to skill up uh, um, uh, workers, it's all in terms of, you know, technology is changing uh, very rapidly and therefore workers need to need to adjust to increase education and continuous training. So the existing narrative is all about workers having to adjust. Uh, we think there's a lot of some room at least for technology to adjust as well, uh, especially since there is no reason to believe that the existing patterns of innovation and technology uh, take all the social externalities of uh, innovation into account. And therefore, both in terms of errors of omission and commission, that is that sort of the implicit incentives that are in the system through R&D and capital incentives, for example, which uh, enhance automation, uh, as well as things that could be done that aren't done, namely taking into account employment and good job possibilities and the complementarity between different types of digital or other innovations and labor, um, and taking those explicitly into account when um, innovation packages are, 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 are developed, uh, as we do, by the way, when we think about green technologies, for example, which is an explicit public objective. I think this is a, a new dimension where we need a lot more thinking and, and some uh, experiments to take place. Uh, finally, I, I think on the international dimension, there's, there's two things that, that we emphasize. One is, um, uh, Stephanie did not talk about that, but uh, that, you know, that in general, we've seen the uh, tax space uh, shift uh, from capital to labor as international capital has become internationally mobile. There is now a very welcome uh, sort of attempt to redress that through international agreements. Uh, we support that, and I think there is more to be done uh, to shore up um, uh, the taxes on, on capital uh, domestically. And secondly, we, pro we, we promote, um, uh, we, we propose uh, what, what we call a social, social anti-dumping clause. Anti-dumping clauses already exist in international trade agreements, but we think there is an argument to be made uh, that existing safeguards uh, can be enhanced uh, to allow countries, uh, in this case the EU, to uphold uh, EU-wide uh, social and labor standards uh, when there are particular types of imports that come in from countries that violate fundamental or universally recognized uh, labor or, or human rights. I think this is important to shore up confidence in the trade system. Stephanie mentioned um, how actually a majority of respondents in France think that it's outsourcing and international trade that's, um, that's, due, uh, that's responsible for, for loss of, uh, of jobs. We as economists might think that uh, that uh, that exaggerates the causal impact, uh, the quantitative impact of trade, but clearly there's a notion that much of trade is really unfair uh, because it involves a certain degree of arbitrage of, of labor standards across countries. And I think having a, an explicit safeguard system that take that kind of arbitrage seriously and and and, and prevents it effectively, uh, I think would be uh, would be benef would be beneficial. Uh, so let me let me just uh, stop here. Thank you. Hi, uh, it's Richard Blundell here. I'm going to say a few words. It's marvelous and fantastic. Um, work that uh, you've just heard a very brief uh, summary of it and uh, I had the great privilege of being a member of the Blanchard Tyrol, Tyrol uh, 
commission and seeing uh, these ideas evolve as we went along. In fact, uh, in fact, we at one point we thought uh, the whole thing would have to go uh, be sidelined by the COVID pandemic. But as we know, these issues have become even more salient and important as we come out of the uh, COVID pandemic. And so uh, I, I'm going to say a few uh, kind of comments on this uh, related a little bit to the UK before we uh, move on, on to uh, open open uh, open discussion i'm going to uh, just uh, i have a couple of uh, couple of slides to uh, share if i can see them there i i hope that that's uh, that's viewable and everyone can hear me okay um this really is an impressive uh, report overall, and this chapter is fantastic. I recommend everyone get uh, a copy of this, uh, uh, and you can get it free online, as you say. Um, the way they frame their analysis with this cross-cutting view of economic inequality is really uh, fantastic and refreshing. I like very much, uh, as they write here, an equality, economic inequality manifests itself not only through differences in income and wealth, but also gaps in health, education, opportunities, mobility, and access to quality of work. And you could see how that was all coming together to frame uh, their analysis as much broader uh, than we often think when we look at inequality and inequality uh, policies. Of course, I like this very much. And in fact, it aligns pretty closely to the way we've been thinking in the Deaton review. Uh, that is, you cannot solve all the concerns about inequality through the tax and welfare system alone. And really it requires a, a carefully thought out and integrated policy response across education, training, minimum wealth, health, trade, innovation policies, emphasizing place, as you heard uh, there, the regional inequalities, the clusters of deprivation or lack of opportunities, and bringing together multiple actors, families, government, firms, and this kind of marvelous idea of uh, surveying, communicating, and experimenting. So we're not there yet. We need to understand. And many of these policy ideas, as you heard Danny at the end there, uh, are ripe for experimentation, and we should in in encourage that. The overall aims look uh, attractive too. It's a bit like apple pie, I was thinking. Um, we've got um, equalizing access to a quality education and revising the welfare state. Uh, to think about social protection progressive to account for the change in labor market as 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 stephanie said you know we're not in a labor market where there are there are access to good quality jobs and uh and good, uh, and progress up the job ladder uh, and also to reflect this high level of globalization that we're now in but alongside that this ensure the adequacy of good productive jobs employment focusing on labor market policies and this partnership between um, businesses and people really to think about uh, this good job. And then this rather very innovative idea of um, using new, new methods of surveying and communication between governments and employers uh, to learn about what consumers want, what, what individuals want and how they think about policies. And they bring this, the way I think about it anyway, they bring it all together in this rather nice idea of a good jobs welfare state uh, 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 agenda. And you saw that rather nice um, kind of policy matrix, which has these three columns, pre-production, production and post-production. And you could see the kind of, in some sense, a lot of the new material is in that middle column. But I could go on about that, but really what I wanted to do in the few minutes I'm gonna take here is, is kind of say, well, okay, this was written with France in mind, and are there specific analyses and policy reforms that they think through relevant to the UK? And I, I thought of them in, um, in these kind of five bullet points here as uh, a sum of the ideas in this uh, great report. Uh, the first thing is, do we need a good jobs agenda? Uh, unlike in, in France, employment has been pretty buoyant, at least till COVID struck, and there's some bounce back uh, uh, lightly as well. So when we've got uh, a lot of jobs, actually, do we need to worry about this kind of agenda? 
And uh, my answer is uh, yes, surely we do. Uh, we've seen rising earnings inequality with low productivity and, and low wages, very low pro pro progression for the lower educated, in a way a break in the job ladder and uh, geographical concentrations of uh, deprivation, all of which kind of chime with the, this analysis that means, you know, going beyond the standard analysis of uh, welfare state. The minimum wage, like in France, uh, has propped up the bottom increasingly and very effectively, actually, in the UK. Uh, but it's just propping up the bottom. It doesn't do much for career progression, good quality jobs. It's really... Uh, uh, a very different kind of policy agenda there. And growing numbers of solo self-employed, um, um, and of course they're in a very different position, difficult and different position with access to training and um, other and benefits too. I'll, I might come back to that if I have a few minutes. Um, there are other kind of things we might want to think through too. How important are social externalities of good jobs? Should we be thinking of those? Again, increasingly, we think that's the case, that there are these, uh, that good jobs are very much associated or the opposite of good jobs uh, with poor health, uh, political polarization, and uh, overall productivity. It kind of puts, the way they put it, it kind of puts a bottleneck on developing new technologies when uh, you've got this, uh, low level of uh, skill match at the, at the bottom. And um, what about innovation incentives? This begins to get more controversial and I know not everyone agrees uh, with the idea that you should twist incentives, but the more you think about it, the less controversial it really gets. We already provide plenty of incentives across the board. Um, the ones that are in the tax system, like R&D tax credits, but also others, as Danny mentioned, uh, kind of local, local, uh, local incentives and local allowances. And why shouldn't they uh, reflect? Um, why shouldn't the, those incentives be twisted to uh, to reflect uh, innovations that and technologies that complement good jobs? Uh, and I think there's uh, something in that. I kind of feel there's still an open question about the monitoring and governance of this. We know the more local it gets, the more open to capture is possible of, um, of the wrong, if you want the wrong players. But I think this is a really key issue. Similarly with, uh, with trade policy and conditions and social standards, um, you know, right now we're in the middle of a big debate about whether we should have border adjustments uh, to, ke to allow for the, for imports that have been of goods that have been produced outside a carbon tax area to kind of put some fairness in trade there. But why shouldn't then some minimum social standards and labor market conditions uh, be included? We already have uh, conditions or at least uh, 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 regulations and, uh, uh, and policies that think about child labor, for example. And this obviously can change the perception and the reality, really, of um, of, uh, 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 of trade, and then finally on the tax system. Again, this is a this is a great one, and I could spend the whole time on that. But rethinking inheritance tax, we've worried about that a lot, and I still find that an unbelievably and surprisingly hard thing uh, to reform. But this move that they have to a kind of lifetime beneficiary-based accessions tax like in Ireland is something that we've also uh, uh, been pushing for a long time. And I think it's great to rethink that as well as the other things there. I thought just one slide, Paul, if you'll let me, on why the good jobs policy agenda is relevant for the UK despite employment. And that's just to kind of point through a few things here that characterize what's happened to the labor market in the UK. Employment has certainly grown, but employment alone has not been enough to escape poverty and low earnings, not just, you know, temporarily. This is where families are in long term support of the welfare system. And, you know, that's not the way we thought things would work when we originally thought through these policies. 
we thought that employment was a way into selfish self-sufficiency and into earnings growth of course the minimum wage can prop up the bottom but it doesn't give you that progress out of that in other words we've seen little earnings progression a real uh, kind of low job ladder and increasing prevalence of solo self-employed where most of these um, opportunities are, are very narrow but of course they have a balance of flexibility so this requires some thought but you can uh, if you put it together with the incredibly low rates of on-the-job training in the UK and uh, how that's fallen back during the COVID pandemic and the impact of what has been increasing part-time among men as well and the very poor return if you're just doing part-time work you can see that uh, this is really a low this kind of low productivity low wage uh, bottom of the economy that has a similar kind of feel to that something needs to be done there all highlighted during the pandemic there are bright spots just like danny and stephanie point to uh, there's a few you know over the long term we found uh, firm-based qualification training is the way to go they emphasize that mix of business and uh, skills development and a really good conversation there uh, we found that lower educated workers with certain kinds of skills do in fact uh, progress up the job ladder and do better during their tenure in firms longer tenure more training and that's around a different kind of skill set that we often have in our general vocational program so thinking of the skills is very much like what you find in project quest for example in san antonio that they mention and then r d firm the where this happens most and not just any firms it's firms that are kind of good firms typically firms that are involved in r d and technology surprisingly perhaps with a larger share of educated workers so this complementarity really matters and if you look at the the picture of the uk and see the educational flight and the concentrated of the higher education you can see what a challenge it is in areas uh, to get this kind of good job agenda to work and surely that the welfare system alone just can't do this. So these align well with a good jobs agenda with integrated reforms across tax and welfare system. And it's uh, it's remarkably refreshing and exciting to see this work. I've, I've written a slide with the way I see them working out in the UK context, but I'm not gonna go through them all. Uh, but clearly, if you think through what we do with welfare and credit, through training and skills, through place-based policies and the role of minimum wage and regulation, you can put these together in a kind of comprehensive now uh, package that thinks about this job, good jobs, welfare state, the integration of the welfare part of things with uh, the good jobs agenda. So I find this very attractive. I think it, we could think of it, uh, it, it fits very well with the way we might think of developing policy in the UK and actually aligns very closely with uh, the thinking in the Deaton Review. I should add that Danny and Stephanie are both contributing to the Deaton Review, which is wonderful. So I just leave, uh, leave that slide there, which the way I thought of it as I was reading this uh, remarkable piece. And, um, and yes, I think the answer to the last question is there specific analysis and policy reforms are relevant to the UK and we should take them pretty seriously in thinking through the set of policies that we might follow. And I'll open it back to Paul for uh, questions. Thanks very much. Well, thank you, Richard, um, Stephanie, Danny. That was fantastic set of presentations. And I, and I hope everyone listening as it were, kind of gets a sense of what, well, at least among economists, is, is I think quite a radicalism among uh, some of these thoughts. I think I think that Stephanie put it really nicely by saying that you know, often we think about the pre-market redistribution, education and all those sorts of things, and the post-market redistribution, welfare and tax, but not very much in the middle. It, it got a little bit of a bad name in Britain in the 2015 election when um, Ed Miliband, leader of the Labour Party, talked about pre-distribution. Uh, but actually, I think that's to some extent what uh, some of this is about. Before I move to the questions in Slido, and please do keep adding questions there, I mean, I, I would just like Stephanie and, and Danny particularly just, just to reflect on, I mean, I mean, how much of a, 
I mean, how, to what extent do you see the, the sorts of things that you've been saying as a sharp move from what you might we might think of ha- of having been economic orthodoxy, I suppose, in the UK and the US, certainly for the last 40 years or so, um, I, 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 is one question. And secondly, um, how, how big are the delivery or uh, barriers here? In particular, um, you know, one of the things that we've historically worried about in these kind of, con- in these kind of contexts our state failure, essentially, the failure to get this kind of policy right, um, and therefore, you know, the potentially negative consequences of that, which is why, you know, in, in a sense, um, you know, a large part of the consensus has been about leaving much of this more to the market than I think is the um, sort of direction that you're going in. So, Stephanie and then Danny, would you like to just kind of respond a little to that that sort of high level set of thoughts sure uh, i can take actually the second part i think danny will be uh, uh will be terrific on on the first big question you asked but for the second one which is a very commonly shared worry that of course we have as well uh which is when you when you ask for some intervention how that's actually going to be implemented is a critical is a critical question and actually in the report, we go quite a bit in depth about the need to have a, a very interactive and you know, cumulative progressive process for this. So to take the example of labor market policies that are done you know, in cooperation with employers locally, uh, that actually requires a constant dialogue and feedback and iteration. So it's not about implementing things you know, straight away fundamentally different, but actually getting there through trial and error with local employers so that exactly you know the implementation issues are taken into account and complementary to that is this whole part about dialogue between citizens and and government at many levels that is needed um, to actually provide feedback from people who are you know in the end the stakeholders who have information that's on the ground and that needs to be uh, brought up and so a lot of the report is actually about this whole process of iterative feedback um, and cooperation with the local stakeholders. Yeah, I mean, let me let me complement that. I mean, so the first question, if I understood correctly, is is you know how radical a departure is this is from orthodoxy. Um, you know, I it. Um, there's a sense in which the world has moved faster than high theory. Um, so it is true that from you know from an you know sort of from our ivory tower perspective, I think a lot of these ideas are, are would appear to be novel, um, but they are actually inspired by what's happening on the ground. I mean, there is tremendous amount of expert ex, you know uh, uh, practitioners' experience on sort of everything from sort of municipal level experiments in the UK to sort of very local civic society organizations. Uh, in labor tra- labor training, um, you know, in in the United States, to what localities have been doing to attract um, uh, uh, employment and, and investment. Um, so the the fact is that there is a, 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 there's already sort of a, a kind of a a community of experience in these things at the local level, and the lessons of that haven't sort of percolated up to the to the level of, of, of thinking and theorizing and conceptualizing about that. And also that, that many of these efforts like the Project Quest that, that you know, I mentioned and Richard mentioned, they remain extremely small scale. Um, and and, and uh, so there's not, enough, there's not been enough investment in scaling them up. And I mean, the United States, I mean, if you look at the, the amount of money that is being spent on direct cash grants on firms, as opposed to, you know, the kind of um, uh, much more customized uh, public services on which we know that they actually work much better. It's like one to 20 is the imbalance. So it, there's not enough scaling up. There is not enough learning. There is not enough repositioning of how we should act at the na- national level and think about these things. So that's sort of, uh, I think, um, you know, wh- where, you know, things are missing, but otherwise it's actually not that that sort of radical. These are 
in one way or another things that are already happening but has been sort of under the the radar screen and have not been scaled up and we have not drawn the right conceptual lessons from but let me add a word on also sort of the the question of you know can governments do this you know this the the, the state failure um issue part of the answer is what i've just said you know the governments have been doing them and, and actually sort of you know it, it no there's failure but there's a lot of success i mean paradoxically the the example that we use in our study of successful industrial policy is the regional selective assistance program in the uk which is you know the 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 study that provides the most direct um, uh, and convincing evidence of industrial policy working because of the you know particular method of you know sort of identification and causal inference that's been used in that study because typically it's very hard to get really very good identification in these studies. But yet the one study that actually shows us that industrial policy has been very effective in increasing employment investment, particularly on the smaller medium-sized firms, is the study on a UK program. Um, and so my answer is, you know, when, when a programs that are in principle not designed very well uh, still produce good outcomes, you know, uh, shouldn't we actually, in fact, try to do them better? Or with respect to our social, you know, uh, safeguard, safeguard mechanism, there are already, you know, safeguards like the anti-dumping rules are the worst rules that you can imagine from an economist's perspective. If anti-dumping rules, as they exist, have not been the end of globalization so far, you know, surely something that we can, you know, sort of improve on uh, should move us in the right direction rather than the wrong one. So I think, you know, this issue of state capacity and state failure, uh, frankly, you know, I'm not very concerned about them. That's really uh, interesting um, uh, set of reflections there. I'm going to now move to some of the questions on, on Slido, and um, there's quite a few. So if you do want one answered, then do vote it up the list. Um, the one at the top of the list at the moment uh, is rather an interesting one. I mean, given the comments you've all made um clearly training and retraining are important for the good jobs agenda but does this i mean i mean where, where does where does your work take you in terms of thinking about whose responsibility that is between state employer and employees does that change from where you know where sort of theory might have been a little while ago and um it, how, how should we think about uh, in this context where training fits in and who's responsible who would like to go first on that feels like it might be one for you again danny so um so i mean i think every country is a little bit different i'm not extremely familiar with with the uk context i mean in europe i mean in france you know that that you know there's, there's a obviously a very extensive set of public employment services that are the executive executing agency for implementing active labor um, uh, market policies. But, and then sort of there is a, you know, kind of a range of, 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 of training, um, you know, facilities. And now there's a new kind of um, a fund for employers being able to use training over their lifetime and so forth. Some of the new things that, that Macron has brought on. Uh, but, but the kind of thing that we're advocating in some sense falls in between the responsibility of, of a, a variety of, of institutions, and none of them actually feels that this is really their number one priority. So the, the public employment services, I mean, yes, they've been moving towards more being towards being more employer oriented, so more talking to employers, but the bulk of the job they do is really dealing with, uh, with, with job seekers and administering active labor market uh, programs that are not very much uh, linked up with employers. The training institutes, well, they're just there for training. I mean, they're not, their job is not to hook up with employers and, 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 and with, the, with the workers. Um, sort of, you know, the, the regional, you know, business uh, promotion programs, they typically think um, in terms of um, attracting firms and attracting physical investment. It's very rare that they make, you know, sort of the creation of good jobs as their number one priority. So I think the, the, the issue is really just, you know, sort of reorganizing this set of activities around uh, a, a set of priorities that, um, that we know work. 
um, and and, uh, and 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 making that rise up um, in in the list of, of objectives in a way that um, uh, you know might work better. Richard might want to come in here because you know he um, has been doing very good work actually on 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 on, on these things. So um, I think he would have a lot to say too. I can add. I don't want to take time. So, but I can add a couple of things. I I think in a way where we're, we're not in a horrible position in this regard in the UK. The vocational training system isn't working well, but it could uh, be made to work. And I think there's kind of three points there that come out of this work and what we've been doing. One, you know, one is um, the type of skills. Uh, there's not really any thinking about specifically the type of skills and how they match with what are the successful um, employers and industries in the local area so that kind of combination of the of, of the business and the further education college getting to, together I think that's important it, it happens a bit but it doesn't happen enough and designing the curriculum around that and making sure it's kind of firm based not just any firm as, as Danny said so well it's about the type of firm as well and uh, that's absolutely key, where you work. And so I think involving what we call the work coaches, which are the, are the people kind of matching uh, the work with the, the work with the firm alongside the vocational uh, training program that's part of that link is, 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 is really key. And I think we could go a long way in this, actually. And everyone's very excited about reforming vocational training tra vocational training in the UK it certainly needs it and I think there's uh, there's great potential here to uh, think this through more carefully you know post-covid mismatch and thinking about good jobs and job ladder and all of that has just highlighted uh, these points so yeah I, I think there's a lot of good evidence about what could work and we just need to bring it to bear um Stephanie, if you want to say something on that, then please do. But um, let me first ask, um, there's a number of questions here. I think essentially about um, the inheritance tax. And I, I think people will be interested in a little more detail on, on how you think that might work, how it's worked in Ireland, how you can make some form of inheritance tax more acceptable. Um, so maybe, Stephanie, you could have a, have a shot at that. But if you do want to say anything on training, do feel free. Great. Um, no, on training, I think Danny and Richard answered uh, really well. For the inheritance tax, the the issue is the issues with current systems are that as soon as they try to exempt some types of assets or some types of households, it is actually very easy to manipulate and to essentially benefit, you know, much wealthier households. Um, in in countries like France, one of the major challenges is that the system is myopic to different transfers that happen throughout your life. So they're periodically forgotten. So if you receive something, you know, 20 years ago, it will not be treated jointly with what you get 20 years later. Um, same for getting transfers from different beneficiaries, etc. And so one of the solutions to this is to actually keep track of everything one person is getting uh, throughout their life. And it has the added benefit of being able to you know, truly exempt some type of people based on the total amount they will receive rather than transfer by transfer and to really implement a proper progressivity in that way. You know, the other major challenge that I alluded to is very different. It's, it's related to the perceived fairness of these systems. Um, and there, you know, I, I try to emphasize this fundamental dilemma, which I guess all of you and all of us can understand by some introspection, which is it is very difficult to uh, trade off the benefits of equality of opportunity for the, for the children. And then, you know, the cost of taxing perhaps hardworking parents that save in order to give, you know, to give something to their children. And so while this fundamental dilemma has no perfect solution, people are much more accepting of it if it exempts, you know, a large part of the middle class and really targets very wealthy, um, you know, high income families to really break, you know, break the link for very large fortunes of, and, and large wealth levels. Um, and so this Tony Atkinson suggested system is, uh, of course, second best, there's just no first best solution, but 
is a second best solution to both the you know, avoidance and myopia um, problems that current systems have and to the fairness or at least addressing a bit of the fairness concerns that, that citizens have. I also think um, it's you know, based on the very large misperceptions that there are about these types of taxes that some sort of voter education would also be very helpful um, we see this very clearly in experimental work that we've done here in the US with Mike Norton, Ileana Kuziemko, and Emmanuel Saez, that if you simply tell people that actually the state tax only hits you know, one in thousand or less a state, um, it very much shifts their views and makes them much more supportive of, of having such an estate tax. Uh, so a very, you know, very, very simple intervention of just mentioning that number is already incredibly effective in in switching people's views. Uh, so I think there's quite a bit to be done on that on that end too. I mean, I, I think that that all of that rings true with the with the British um, debate, where uh, it, there, there are so many ways of avoiding it if you're extremely wealthy. Uh, it strikes me that one of the problems people have with inheritance tax is the is the sense it's unfair because it catch, captures the middle class who have a house to hand on from which it's really hard to avoid but it doesn't capture the super wealthy who can either hand stuff during life or uh, keep things in um, trusts or abroad or in other ways which manage to avoid it um let, let's move on i'm quite interested in um, I don't know whether uh, any of you fancy taking this but I, i'm quite interested in the question which is um, whether you see a role for financial sector regulation in all of this. Clearly, the financial sector is terribly important, particularly in the UK context. Um, it's important in, in lots of senses, one being that a, a lot of the growth right at the top of the income distribution has been driven by the financial um, sector. Uh, but it's also potentially important in terms of where the finance from that sector goes and gets invested. I'm guessing, Danny, you might be best placed to start us on that. Yeah, it's a tough question. Uh, 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 I mean, before I answer on this, let me mention, because Stephanie mentioned um, uh, Tony Atkinson a couple of times, and I just wanted to uh, uh, also say that uh, Tony Atkinson was the first person that I know who uh, advocated um, this idea that the direction of technological change should be um, a matter of public policy um, uh, in his book on inequality from a few years back. That, that featured very prominently uh, among his, um, his suggestions. Um, and I, I think he was the first in making that point. Um, and uh, so, it, so that idea, um, which as, as Richard rightly mentioned is controversial, has very good intellectual pedigree. Um, on the financial sector, we, we don't really talk about that too much in our report, except for in the context of ensuring there is enough information sharing across countries um, so that um, um, you know, um, income taxes on wealthy individuals and certainly the corporate, corporate taxes can be, uh, can be sustained and that, that you know, global race to the bottom can be, uh, can be avoided. But I suppose if we were writing the report for, for the UK, it would have been hard to avoid the financial sector. I don't know exactly what I would say, but my view always has been that the UK, that the, the over emphasis on finance uh, in, uh, in the UK has had a lot of adverse implications for good jobs and employment um, through sort of, you know, um, uh, a model of specialization that's obviously very, you know, favorable towards high skilled professional workers um, and overvalued exchange rate that comes with the export of financial services and, a lot, and with a correspondingly large trade deficit in goods and manufacturing and probably has been a factor in, in accelerating uh, the industrialization and this, you know, sort of pockets of regional deprivation as, as Richard has put it. So the role of the finance, financial sector, I think in, in both in a narrow sense of high incomes but also in a kind of a general equilibrium sense of what it has meant for the structure of the economy and the, na the nature of jobs uh, that Britain has generated, um, I, I think has been very fundamental. Now, I mean, one question I had post-Brexit was, you know, whether that would entail a different 
pattern of specialization, whether the British government, you know, sort of post-Brexit Britain moves towards a much more sort of goods uh, and uh, sort of middle-class services kind of orientation as opposed to a, you know, financial sector. You know. But that's sort of, you know, all up in the air, but there is a fundamental question about what's the growth policy, what's the fundamental economic development policy of, of a country like, like Britain that, that I think requires some serious thinking. And yeah. um, it's obviously is not something that we did in this report. One small little addition, which has come up in the Deaton Review is just how uh, the kind of venture capital and the investment and the kind of interaction with firms is, has become more and more concentrated in the Southeast and how the kind of bank to firm linkages in the North, it, it, which were very prevalent during various phases of industrial growth in the UK, has kind of disappeared. Now, what's the causality there is more difficult, but in particular, Colin Mayer has made that a strong case that uh, in fact, the organizations of banks and their links to firms is important in um, in getting kind of uh, away from kind of zombie firms and getting more productive firms across the geographies in uh, the UK and and we're certainly we're certainly looking into that. I think it's a very interesting point. Um, right, thank you. We, we are, I'm afraid, at the uh, end of our time, and I'm sorry we've had slightly less time we'd like. That was largely down to uh, an IT failure at my end. But, uh, my apologies for the wait um, at the beginning. We've gone through one huge set of issues here on, uh, on inequality and how we might deal with it. Um, we are working, as Richard has alluded to, on a lot of this as part of our Deaton review. Um, and our first major output of that is due in a couple of weeks, where we'll be looking at... Um, uh, attitudes to inequality and reasons why we might be worried about inequality. And actually, I think Stephanie will be um, once again starring uh, in in that alongside um, Deborah Sachs, who will be talking about the philosophy of inequality, and Bobby Duffy from King's College London, who will be uh, providing some up-to-date information on attitudes in the UK. Uh, but in this particular little series, uh, following on from the, 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 the commission uh, that was looking at these these major uh, challenges. We're tomorrow uh, moving from the small issue of inequality to the small issue of climate change and how to deal uh, with that. So I'm really looking forward to that, particularly because again we'll be getting a perspective um, from outside of the um, outside of the UK. Uh, Christian Gollier from the Toulouse School of Economics, and I'm almost certainly going to pronounce this wrong, but Mar Regwant uh, from Northwestern, uh, who will. Uh, be uh, leading off the discussion on uh, on climate change. Um, so uh, that's three o'clock tomorrow. So do do join us again for another big topic. And thank you once again to Stephanie, to Danny, and to Richard. Thank you.